Good morning and welcome to Free Advice Friday. My name is Carrie Barnum. I am the Executive Director of New Shelves Books and we are here for Free Advice Friday. They are every Friday where we get together to talk about book marketing, publishing, really anything related to being to an, an author or marketing books. We do have some questions that were emailed in, which you can also do. Just email info, I-N-F-O, at newshelves.com. And we do have a live session on Zoom, which you are welcome to join at newshelves.com slash F-A-F. And we have questions live, so we are going to take those as well as answer our email questions. Um, Pat is asking, will you be offering a library marketing program for the holidays? Pat, I will be offering one that's kind of geared towards holiday books, uh, the winter holidays, just waiting until school starts. The summer has been a little bit hectic over here with the kids home. So in order to make sure that the library mailing and those of you who sign up for that marketing get the full attention you deserve, I wanted to make sure that school was back in session, that the assistant that helps with that was also available. Um, so we will be doing that. Keep an eye out as we roll into September for some new marketing programs. Um, we also have some other things coming up aside from the library marketing program. Amy Collins and I are going to do a class on market viability, all about how to know if your book will sell into the marketplace, as well as how to gather the materials you need to pitch your book, whether it be to agents for foreign rights, translation rights, um, maybe it's film rights or anything in between, kind of showing that your book has legs and the possibility to sell. So we have that coming up. That will actually be Tuesday nights in October. So that's going to be coming up soon. So if you're not on our mailing list, go join it. You can join in at newshelves.com or you can just email info at newshelves.com and let us know you'd like to join the mailing list. So you will get updates when we do that. Typically when running a marketing program like our mailings, it goes to our mailing list or with our specific partners only. We don't necessarily put it out in public anywhere because it typically fills up first and we want to make sure that we're always giving first dibs to those who, you know, who we've already connected with through our mailing list. So if you are interested in any of those programs where we mail out to libraries or to bookstores, be sure to join the list there. Um, let's see, how do you know exactly when you're ready to launch? What well, has to be solid in place to set a date? So the thing share with setting a launch date is you have to be very confident that your materials will be ready in time. So a couple of things go into that. Are you confident that your book cover and your interior will be done? You need to know before you set a launch date. And typically, if this is your first book, you you might want to wait until those pieces are pretty darn close before you set a launch date if you're self-publishing, just because it will take longer than you anticipate. So that may be something to consider, but also you want to look at the timing. Uh, depending on your book, if you have, let's say, a nonfiction self-help book, December is probably not the best time to launch that book. Simply not, because people are going to be focused on holidays. They're going to be wanting fun things. They're not really necessarily going to be wanting to focus on, I mean, it sounds sad, but in December, we don't necessarily want to face our problems. So we want to pretend they're not there. We want to drink eggnog. I actually hate eggnog, but we do want to sing Christmas carols and be happy and joyful and ignore all of our problems, right? And then come January, February is when maybe we're going to be more in the mind space to, to really work on ourselves. Whereas if you have a fiction, maybe you have a teen young adult novel. Well, then you do want to get out in November early December maybe, so that you can get those Christmas sales that are likely to come in. So it, it does depend on your, your genre, but also being very confident when you set your launch date that your book will be ready for that launch date. You don't want to push back a launch. It is a pain. It's resetting dates and things like that. Another thing to consider is that if you are going to do professional reviews, if you're going to pitch to Kirkus, to Publishers Weekly, to Midwest Book Review, most of those require that you send those submissions in three to four months before your pub date. So keep that in mind, because if you're pitching for professional review, you need your interior and your cover, at least a strong draft done before you can pitch. So if you don't have your interior done and you plan to submit for professional reviews, 
you probably have a launch date that's, I don't know, six months out. But if you've got your interior done and you're ready to pitch for reviews, then maybe it's three to four months. Or if you are working on your interior and you know you're not going to go after those professional reviews, then again, maybe three to four months. But one of the biggest mistakes I see in self-publishing, not traditional, but for self-publishing, one of the biggest mistakes I see is that authors try to rush this, that they think that the files will be done sooner than they will, or they are just determined that this book is going to get out as quickly as possible instead of realizing that things take time, especially if it's your first book, you're going through the process. If you're relying on a designer to do your interior, the designer to do your cover, these are people who also have schedules and it may not be your schedule. Things may take more passes than you thought. Um, I had someone with an interior who thought it'd be super straightforward. They're like, yeah, we just got to get this done. I will have no changes. Lo and behold, not only did they have formatting changes, but they had an index, which had to be completely redone. And then they had a couple of other little changes. That is ending up to take weeks. So I do think that's one of the things you want to consider is how close you are to being complete, what your goals are, and do you intend to do those professional pitches? Are you trying to get events? If you're trying to get a book signing or if you're trying to do a speaking gig to line up with that, most of those are booking out months in advance. I've been um, working over the last month and a half to actually do some signings for a well-known author in October and November. And those slots are already filling up. We're already being pushed out to January. So just think ahead and keep in mind that even though you're anxious to get this out, it's better to make sure that you give yourself enough time to launch well rather than trying to push something out as quickly as possible. And maybe you don't get a proof, so you don't get a printed proof. And then after the book launches, you do. And you realize there is a problem with the book or the cover or the spine. So good things take time, especially if it's your first book. Give yourself some grace. Put some padding in there. Whenever I'm creating uh, publishing or launch schedules with clients, I pad it and they go, oh, well, I won't need that much time. <laughs> well, let's put it in there. And if it's done early, we'll just move things up but I'd rather put the time in there. And you would not believe how many times not only do we need that padding, but sometimes we have to add even more padding in. So it's not a process to be rushed. All right, let me see here. I had emailed questions, which I wanted to answer, not that one. All right, a question from Kate is what are your thoughts on collaborating with another fiction author? Two novellas written by two different authors compromising one book. That, set, that tends to be the trend right now. Um, I think that working with another author on collaboration can be so smart, but there are some ups and downs, so let's chat about them, right? So collaboration with another author, especially if their name is as recognized as your own. So do you both have um, a series out? Are you both working on your mailing list? Is it kind of two, two equals coming to the table? I think that's one of the things you wanna look for in a collaboration partner. You want to make sure that you're collaborating with people that will either meet you in the middle or bring you up. Um, not to say that you can't give emerging authors a try or that you won't be able to work with them, but depending on your goals, you typically want to find someone kind of on the same keel as you. As far as how that collaboration works, I've seen it several ways. It may be where you're actually writing a book together. You are passing it back and forth. I'm actually um, talking to a client right now who's doing this and it's kind of fun. It's him and his two sons. So they each write a chapter and they each have, I think they have a character. So they're kind of each following the character through the story and they'll write the chapter and then they'll pass it to the next person who will critique it. And then it comes back to them and then it passes to the other person and they critique it. So they are actually writing an entire series collaboratively together. Now that takes a lot of, it takes a lot of collaboration. What we see more often, as you said, Kate, is where people are writing, um, as a collaborative novella. So each author is contributing a novella to a bigger book. 
very often we don't see this go to print. Often we will see this just as an ebook. Now it may be a novella, maybe a short story. The important thing is, is that each of the authors has the same genre or the same audience. If you are doing Amish romance, you want to make sure that you've got another author who is either an Amish romance or in, in kind of the same feel of women's fiction. You have to be very careful of that. You do not want a really steamy romance author with an Amish romance author. That's not going to work because you're not going to hit the same audience. So that's something to consider as well. I have seen this done recently. It was women's fiction. I think it was, uh, I think it was 10 authors, 10 authors who kind of all had a platform. They all got together. They all wrote a novella that was exclusive to this book. They agreed it would be exclusive for like six months or something like that. They all did this novella. They put it together as an ebook. They put it up everywhere for 99 cents and they sold the heck out of it and they hit the USA Today bestseller list. So for them, that was the strategy. They really wanted to hit a bestseller list and this is the strategy they used to get there. And they sold a heck of a lot of copies in that first week. Um, so sometimes there's a point there. Sometimes it's simply to collaborate and share audiences. I've also seen um, in this year as well, where authors did the same idea. They sold the book full price though. So let's say it was $9.99 and 10 authors got together. But what they did is each short story was their lead magnet. And in the back of that short story was um, like the next book free. And they sent them to book funnel to sign up for their mailing list, meaning that they're trying to get them hooked on the entire series and they're getting them signed up for their newsletter. So there are a lot of ways to work collaboratively collaboratively with different goals. So it's really important that you know what your goal is going into it. What are you looking to get out of the collaboration? And will this collaboration get you there? Is it a bestseller? Is it a new audience? Is it to build your mailing list? What do you want out of it? And then make sure that that is in line with the other authors. Make sure that you're working well there. I've also seen author collaborations where they are simply sharing. Um, I just heard of a um, group of 12, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a group of 12 authors who are doing a round robin for their newsletter. So each month, one author is going to offer some piece of content free, um, whether it be a whole book or short story, something, they're going to have something free and the other 11 people in that group are going to share it to their mailing list. Now, they all have mailing list upwards of 5,000. So they are all being featured for to 11 other people. And then they will feature 11 people over the course of a year. So that way they are sharing their audiences and they're collaborating in that way. And that way they can build their newsletter audience, which means that they can sell to these people in the future. Keeping in mind that again, it's the same genre. It's the same basic reader group. So that way, if my book is in the same genre, if it's got the same reader avatar as yours, then it stands to reason that maybe my audience would like your book and they would go on to buy your books and vice versa. So again, the key to author collaboration is making sure that you know what you want out of it and that you're working with other authors who are on the same page as you. Because I've also seen author collaborations where one person wanted a bestseller and they didn't care how they got there. And another person was like, oh, I just wanted to work with all the other authors. I just kind of wanted the experience. Well, they didn't align and it got a little bit ugly. Um, I think that there's also collaborations sometimes where, you know, who's going to do what? Because I've seen collaborations where maybe one person is doing the bulk of the work and then the other five people are just kind of contributing. And that can get a little bit messy too. Whose account is this going to be under? What's the purpose of it? So author collaboration can be beautiful if it's done well and if you go in with intention and your goals in mind. Let's see, can the book be out available to buy before the launch date? So let's talk about the difference between what's commonly kind of known as a book launch 
and then the pub date. They're often used interchangeably because for many books, the pub date is the book launch date. And that's true, most of the time it's one and the same, but the pub date is when the book goes alive, when it's available for sale. The launch date is kind of the day that you're launching that book. When you're doing the fanfare, you're doing the reviews, you're, you're doing a book tour. So you can launch your book after your pub date. It can be up for sale and you can say, look, it's been up for sale for three weeks, three months. I've been working on reviews. Now I really wanna launch it and get into the marketing and the PR. Yes, that can be done. However, when we're talking about, let's say professional reviews, professional reviews are going by the pub date. So I know I said launch date, but I was using it interchangeably, guilty. Um, and so they're actually referring to the pub date. So if you try to send in, let's say, to shelf awareness and your book is already out, they're going to say, nah, -uh, not happening. Your book's not eligible. Um, if you were trying to do a blog tour, you're trying to set up a author reading or something like that three months after your pub date, that's okay. Most stores, libraries, and things will still go for that as long as it's within the same year or so of that pub date. So you can launch after your pub date. But some of the items, some of the things you're not eligible for or not as appealing. So they will want it closer to the pub date, depending on what you're going after. Um, how early do you, uh, does the review process before launch or BookBub? Is it hard to get accepted on BookBub? What other sites do you suggest for non-professional reviews? That's a good question. So as far as how early in the review process before you launch, do you want to work on reviews? We've already talked about professional reviews, which is typically three to four months out. If we're talking about reader reviews, we're talking about star ratings on Amazon. We're talking about um, Goodreads reviews. We're just talking about reader excitement and actually getting it out there. Um, those, you can really start anytime. I have seen, I was working with an author who I looked at his book and I was like, buddy, your book has been out for years and it's a good book. It was put out by Harper Collins and you've got like 15 reviews. We got to work on this. We got to amp this up. And we started working on that. He's now up over 50 reviews and his book is selling more now than it did when it launched six years ago. So you can absolutely bring those reviews back. You can bring back a backlist. As far as where and how to find those reviewers, you can start at any time, but if you are going to launch a new book, I recommend that you start working on your reviews two to three months before your launch. Here's the thing though, when you're working on a new book, especially and you're going to launch the book, you need to find reviewers first. You need to find people who are willing to review your book then you have to set a plan in place of when they will get the book, how you're going to manage that. And typically we would call that your street team, your launch team, your art team. Again, lots of different terms for it. But the idea is there's a core group of people who are going to get your book for free and they in turn are going to consider leaving you a review. Now we can't force them to, that would actually be against the terms. We can't pay them to, but we can say, hey, I've got a core group of readers. I'm giving free copies to if you're interested. Um, I'd really love to get some feedback and review. I'm happy to send you a book. And if you feel like you're able to review it honestly, then I encourage you to do that. So you want to find those people. You want to find the interested people who will review your book two to three months before your launch at least. But you don't want to give them the book right away. And here's why. If I read a book in September that's coming out in December, I can't leave a review on Amazon until the book goes live. I can leave a review on Goodreads, but I can't do Amazon, which is where a lot of those ratings really matter for sales. So if I read a book in September, maybe I think it's great, but I don't write a review and then, you know, rolls around December, close to the holidays, things are picking up and it's been months and you say, oh, hey, my book is live now. Will you go leave a review? This is what I'm gonna do. I remember I liked that book. It was a good book. I've read like 20 books since. Um, I'm either going to make up a review that's pretty non-specific or 
chances are I'm going to go, oh, that sounds like a lot of work because I don't really remember that book anymore. Or like I'm just out of that headspace or I'm busy. And then I never leave a review. So when you're working with an ARC team, it's important that you give them updates. You set expectations of when you will give them the book. And then you remind them when the book comes out that it's now available to leave reviews. So I typically recommend, depending on what type of book you have, if you have a nonfiction book that's going to take a while to read, I recommend that you prep people that they will be getting the book the month before the launch date. And then you give them that book, whether it be in print or ebook copy, you give them that about a month before the launch date. You follow up the week before your launch and you say, hey guys, we're almost there. I know you've had the book for about three weeks. Hopefully you've had a chance to read through it. If you run into any problems, you have any questions, let me know. But otherwise, I'll be sending out an email next week letting you know the book is live so you can go leave your review then. And then you do that and you're more likely to get reviews. If you've got, let's say, a children's book, no one needs a month to read a children's book. Same process applies, but you can probably get them that file about two weeks in advance. Um, fiction books, again, depending on what kind of genre it is, how voracious your reader it is, anywhere from two to three weeks, just kind of depends. Um, and that's for a launch, that's for a new book. Now, if we're talking about places to get a review anytime, NetGalley is traditionally one of the places that people can give away free ebook copies of their book and then get reviews. Mixed reviews on how those reviews turn out, if they ever go off of NetGalley and get put up to Goodreads or Amazon. But it is kind of one of the industry standards that we expect to see. Um, and NetGalley is a little bit pricier. There are co-ops where you can um, essentially rent out a month of NetGalley from someone who's got a subscription. And I've seen those range anywhere from $50 to $150 for a month. Then you have places like IBPA. If you're a member, you can do a three month um, entry into NetGalley. And I think that is I'm going to say it's like $2.99. I might be giving the right price, but IBPA does a discount and they do a three month kind of thing. And then you can go directly to NetGalley where you do six months. And I believe that's $4.99. Don't quote me on the prices. It's been a little while since I looked at them, but it's not cheap. <laughs> but there are other options. Book Sirens. Book Sirens is a place where they actually allow you to host your files and then they work to push out and ask reviewers if they're interested in your book, and then they help you manage that process. Um, another one is going to be something like um, Hidden Gems. Hidden Gems is very affordable. Uh, they You can reserve your spot for $20, and then you pay depending on how many people actually take or accept your book. I think the cap on there is around $400 or maybe $420. Um, so very inexpensive because you're only paying for what you're getting and it's $20 to reserve. Do keep in mind that Hidden Gems books out way in advance. They're already booking into 2023, like uh, spring, maybe summer 2023. So you do have to grab those in advance. Um, let's see. Some of the other places that you might look for reviews would be um, doing a Goodreads giveaway, doing a Goodreads giveaway. So you get people who are interested in the book, you give away books, you can do eBooks or you can do um, physical print copies and you can get reviews that way. You can also go to BookFunnel. You can go straight to BookFunnel and give them a free copy and ask for reviews and get people to sign up for your mailing list so you can follow up with them. So you do have options for reviews, but they do take work. And I always say this, about 10% of the people who say, yeah, I'll take a copy of your book, about 10% will actually go leave a review. So if you're really trying hard to get 15 reviews, because that's kind of the minimum cap that I recommend before running Amazon ads, if you are, if it's, you know, if you're hoping for 15 reviews, you want to find 150 reviewers who say, yes, we'll take a look at your book because 10%. Now, sometimes you'll get more, sometimes you'll get less, but 10% is pretty darn common from what I've seen in the industry and what other industry people that I work with have seen as well. And how do you gently ask people who have told you they bought your book to please review it? 
Uh, well, it depends on how well you know them, Catherine. If you know them really well, that's when you're like, so you ready to review that book yet? Nudge, nudge, gonna text you. Uh, but if it's someone that's just kind of a, a general acquaintance who has read the book uh, and ask, if you don't ask, you're not gonna get. So make sure you ask, whether it be putting it out generally on social media or through your newsletter saying, hey, if you've read the book, please go review it. It means the world to me. If it's someone you know personally, then you can absolutely, you know, if the book comes up or if you're talking to them, you know, what do you think of it? And depending on what they say, maybe they say they haven't read it yet. Maybe they say, oh yeah, I read it and I loved it. You can say, I'm so glad to hear that. If you think about it, would you consider going to leave a review online? Reviews really mean so much to an author. And here is the thing. People who are not authors do not realize how important reviews are to authors. Your friends, your audience, if they are not in the know, they do not realize what a difference in sales, in income, in success reviews can have. So you have got to tell them. Those people who want to support you may be brushing off for a review because they simply don't realize how important it is, which is why I always say, put it out there. Reviews make a world of difference. It means that other readers can find my book and decide if they like it. So if you did like it, or if you've read my book, please consider going to leave a review or just drop a rating. Amazon now has Kindle has ratings. You can just rate it, super easy. I also have a video up on YouTube. If you go to youtube.com slash new shelves books, and in the little search bar, you search review. I have videos on how to leave a review at Amazon and at Barnes and Noble. And in those videos, I also tell people how to write a really, really easy review. There are three steps to an easy review in, in Carrie's opinion. That is, um, did you like the book? What was your favorite part and would you recommend it? If they answer those three questions, even with just short sentences, I really like this book. My favorite part was when Catherine met Linda and they had a grand old time out at the bar. Highly recommended for fans of rom-com. That's it. That's an amazing review. We love it. Go leave it. So if you're looking for some resources, maybe to share with people who are willing to write reviews, but are maybe getting stumped on what to write or the technology of leaving a review, go check out those YouTube videos. Feel free to share them. Um, I have a lot of people who think that it's helpful to really see. I'm a visual learning learner myself. So if someone's like, oh, here's a video and it shows you exactly where to go on Amazon to leave a review. I'm like, oh, okay, I can do that. We found a new fruit at my house. I'm going to murder the name. Forgive me. It's Rambutan, Rambutan, something like that. It's R-A-M-B-U-T-A-N. It's an Asian fruit. It's often found in the Philippines. Anyway, we found it and my kids are like, mom, this looks like a sea urchin. We have to get it. And so, okay, I'll get it. And then it's out my fridge because I don't know what to do with it. How do I cook this thing? So what do I do? I go to YouTube. I needed a visual to get me started. I needed a nudge. And a lot of people are the same way with reviews. Um, let's see, is Amazon still wearing reviews for your Facebook friends? Yes, there are times, of course, where Amazon is in the top three search engines in the world. They know things, right? Just like Google, just like your phone, just like if I start talking to my husband about not wanting to make dinner and suddenly I'm scrolling through Facebook and there's like the local pizza places ad. Yes. Facebook and Amazon, they all kind of share information. They collect data on you. And sometimes someone that you know personally will be blocked from leaving a review. It will either not post the review or it'll block them. That's okay. It just won't show up. Um, and so I wouldn't worry too much about it. Amazon's policy is that anyone who knows you personally, who has a personal stake is related to you. So for example, I never ever review books that I've worked on because I cannot do so in good conscience because I have a personal stake in those books. Um, if I had a book, I would not have my husband go review it because again, those personal stakes. So there are some rules there. And again, I do cover that in the video. And Catherine's asking, what if the people you ask don't like it? Uh, well, number one, they're probably not going to tell you that. But sometimes, guess what? People are not leaving reviews for your book because they didn't like it and they don't want to tell you that. 
uh, hard truth, but I'm here to give you those hard truths. Sometimes that's why people don't review a book because they didn't like it. And then we've been taught for years and years, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. So sometimes that's what it is. Um, now, sometimes they'll tell you they didn't like it, or sometimes, you know, depending on your level of friendship, they'll be like, well, it was pretty good, but I had a major problem with this. Chat about it. Maybe it's something you want to consider revising or editing. Maybe it's something that you're pretty firm on. It just depends. And if they don't like it, they don't like it. Not everyone has to like us. Uh, I was talking to an industry friend today, griping, we're griping with love, all about how your book is not for everybody. Anyone, when I ask someone's audience and they say, oh, everyone would enjoy my book. Meh. No, everyone's not going to enjoy your book because if your book, even if it's fantastic, is written for adults, my seven-year-old is not going to enjoy it. If your book is a children's book, could I as a parent pick it up and read it? Yes, but it's not for me. And sometimes people just don't like your writing. They don't like the content. It's not their thing. And that is okay. So part of being a great writer, a great author, and a great marketer of your work is realizing that not everyone's going to like your book and that's okay. If they have feedback, we should listen to it. Maybe their feedback will help us grow. Maybe their feedback is like, hey, you had a lot of proofing errors. That's fixable. You can go back and fix that. Sometimes it's something where they just didn't, they didn't like your main character. He was a blonde and she didn't like that. She's really into redheads, blondes are out. So you know what? She hated the book. So what? Okay, great. Then we move on and we find new readers. There's plenty of them out there. Um, let me see here. Where's the best place to get help with feedback on your author bio and your book description? There are people on Readsy who do it. Brian Cohen's team over at Best Page 4 does it. Um, new Shelves does some of that for clients, depending on how we're working with you. Um, sometimes simply putting it out there and asking a writing group. Ask at Free Advice Friday, the Free Advice Friday group. You guys, that's there for you guys to ask questions. We ask that you don't promote yourself, but if you're talking about author bio, bios and you're like, hey, here's my author bio, would anyone like to give me feedback? That's totally cool. Go put it in the group. There's a couple hundred people in there who could give you feedback and comment. That's what it's there for. Find a local writers group. There are so many resources for you. Just got to put it out there and connect with them. Um, is a Goodreads giveaway a good thing to do even if the book has been out for a few years and if a giveaway has been done uh, for it a couple of years ago? Here's the thing, Eileen, um, when talking about Goodreads giveaway, typically, in my opinion, <laughs> everyone has one, but mine is always right, um, obviously joking, but in my opinion, a Goodreads giveaway is great when the book launches, and the reason why is it gives it a lot of exposure. It's like a billboard. I have a book up right now that I put up uh, less than a week ago, I think, and it's already got almost 3,000 people requesting a copy. That is tons of exposure. It's people adding it to their to read list, which means that they will be getting a notification when that book goes live, that it's live and it will include sales links. This is a win. Um, but as far as reviews, I will say that, um, when you're getting reviews, again, remember that 10%. So if you're doing a giveaway with five print copies, actually print copies, I think your stats are a little higher, but not everyone's going to go leave a review. If you do 100 Kindle copies, yeah, expect maybe 10 to 15 reviews. So you have to keep that in mind. And keep in mind also that when doing a giveaway, people are more interested in a new or upcoming book. They do pay attention to that. If the book's been out for a while, I'm not saying it will get no attention, but it won't get as much attention as it would if it was launching. So that would not be one of my top strategies for reviving your backlist for getting new interest in an older book. It's not going to hurt you, but it would not be one of the top places that I would personally recommend you spend $119 to give the book away. I think that you'd be better off with Facebook ads, Amazon ads, building your newsletter list through book funnel or different things like that. All right, I had a question emailed in from Richard. Um, Richard, I hope you're on here. 
Hey, you are. Hi, Richard. I'm glad you're able to make it on this week. And so Richard and I were talking this week and we were talking about doing a giveaway for your ebook and how that can be a good way to build reviews and also to kind of get interest in a series. So if your book is on Kindle Unlimited, for example, and you have an entire series, giving away the first book in series can be what we call a loss leader in a great way to really get that book out there into the hands of a lot of new readers. Using that 10% model, you may even get new reviewers. So for example, I just, um, just mid last August, mid last August, I've lost my mind, you guys, just mid month last month in August, I did a giveaway for um, first book in series of a book that has the seventh book that just came out. And so we did a giveaway knowing that we wanted to build up more reviews, build up new readership and excitement as the seventh book was coming out. And so we did that. Now, my philosophy is, and I hear this a lot, is I did a giveaway on Amazon. I did a giveaway and I had people download it. I shared it on social media, whatever it may have been. And people say, you know, I got anywhere from 50 to 150 downloads, which is awesome like let's not overshadow that that is awesome however if when you're doing those giveaways you consider investing a little bit of money into the discount promotion newsletters things like the fussy librarian free book see these things are typically fairly inexpensive they will run depending on the genre they will run anywhere from like 20 bucks up to 100 bucks and when you do that and you promote to their list you're reaching a whole new audience that is already looking for cheap or free ebooks so this time i did a promotion it was for historical fiction and we gave away the first book in series free we put it in free booksy uh, the Fussy Librarian, and Book Cave. So we did three newsletters. I think altogether we might have spent $100, $150 on promotions for this ebook, which sounds crazy, right? Like, please spend money to give your book away. But yes, we did it. And here's what happened. Because we use these other newsletters who had big mailing lists, we gave away over 3,000 copies of book one. 3,000 copies over the course of three days. That's a heck of a lot of copies. And yes, we call that our loss leader because we lost money. Not only did we give a book away, but we paid $150 to do it. But what happened was that book after two days started getting more reviews. It's already jumped up over 30 reviews just since, I mean, this was August 15th. So in less than a month, we've already got more than three uh, 30 new reviews for this book, 10% rule. We'll see if we get more, but again, we've got about 10% that have gone on to leave reviews or ratings for the book. We also have seen a dramatic increase of both sales and Kindle Unlimited page reads for the rest of the series. We can literally watch it. It's like you see book two suddenly is skyrocketing. Then book three is skyrocketing. Then you can see some people who maybe download the book and didn't read it right away, they're starting to read. So it's like this whole like funnel going up. Page reads have been through the roof. Sales have been through the roof because we use that loss leader effectively to make sure that we are pushing it out as much as possible. If we're gonna give the book away for free, let's do it big. Let's spend $150 to make that happen. We've gotten new reviews because this author has a freebie in the back of his book. He has a lead generator in the back of his book where it says, if you enjoyed this story, click here and get a, a origin story of how these people met. He's getting new people signing up for his own mailing list, his own newsletter list, so he can market to them in the future, which is more value. And then he is getting sales and more reviews throughout the entire series. It's been amazing. And this will often work for authors who are trying to do that. And the question from Richard specifically was, how do we run one of these? And what are some of the places for discount newsletters? So I'm going to share my screen because I did actually write an article for this um, called When BookBub Doesn't Bite. Because of course, BookBub is like the, the 
the biggie. If you can get a BookBub for a free deal or a discount deal, you are going to probably sell a lot of copies and it's a big deal. But sometimes you don't get BookBub or BookBub can be upwards of $900 for a discount promotion. So maybe you can't afford that. That's all right. There are other options. So I do have this whole article about what you can do, ways you can promote it outside of newsletters as well as newsletters. But we also have a list of newsletters right here and they're all linked. So some of them, not exclusively, but some that I really enjoy are The Fussy Librarian, Bargain Booksy, which if you're doing a free book is free booksy, Just Kindle Books, Book Barbarian, Robin Reads, and then another one is Book Cave. I've used them more recently. And there are more. That's a start. Um, there's, a, I think, Hello Books is Mark Dawson's, and that's kind of gaining momentum. So there are other options. But I'm going to drop the link into this specific blog into the chat. If you are watching the replay or if you're not with us real time, you can certainly go to the New Shelves blog and just search. And I'll drop that in. So that has resources, not only how to run a, a free book promotion to maximum potential, but also a list of places that you can promote your book to and some of those lists that I personally recommend and use. Um, and that's the thing is that I typically don't recommend things I haven't already used. So I do love this set of, of newsletters specifically. I think they're cost efficient and I think that they're a really great way. Some of them will accept any book and some of them do require that you submit your book. So not everyone will take them. Um, and sometimes you'll get denials. I, I had a, I had a USA Today bestseller get denied for one of these because it's simply not what their audience wanted or it's not what they're looking for. They had too many. I don't know. So again, going back to the not everyone can love you all the time and sometimes you'll get rejection and it's okay. We moved on and we found other things and it was fabulous. Let me see another question here. When do you um, get your author central page? So your author central page and a lot of author pages actually if we're talking about Goodreads, if you're a first time author, very important. Not if you've already been, an, if you've already got published works, but if you're a first time author, if you've got a first time book, Goodreads, um, BookBub, Author Central, many of the places where you can get an author profile are not available for you until the book is alive on a site. Now, I do mean live or pre-order or anything else. It does not have to actually have been published. It does have to be up and available for sale on a retail site. Typically, Amazon is the one that a lot of them will link back to. So until your book is up for either sale or pre-order on Amazon, you cannot claim an author central profile. You cannot get a Goodreads profile because it's owned by Amazon and you cannot get a book up author profile. So that is something that you will either want to set up pre-order so you can access and you can submit for those things in advance. Or if you're not doing a pre-order, you will just want to have that on your list of things to do as soon as the book goes live because they don't automatically accept you. Again, they are vetting to make sure that you, you know, you should have that author profile. So very important that you kind of look at that and you consider before you, you know, again, it's all in the planning, but that's kind of the timeline there. All right, um, I think we've got time for this one last question. What do the best author websites look like and have? Uh, I could teach, I have taught an entire class on that. So this is the shortened version share. A author website is going to be clean and easy to navigate. Do not, <laughs> I'm not a knickknack person. And so I like websites the same way, and a lot of people do, is that you want the information that you want on there, but let's not over clutter it. Let's not over complicate it. So the best author websites, in my opinion, are going to have an about tab or an author tab. I want to learn about the author. I want to know about you. And on that page should be your bio, should be your headshot. It should be clear. I should be able to see you and I should know a little bit about you. There should be a books tab where I learn about either your one book or your multiple books, and I can see and have purchase links for your books, your book cover, your description, purchase links. 
for the love that's all that's holy. Please do not just list Amazon. If your book is up and available wide, if it's up through Ingram Spark and available through bookshop.org, if it's available through Baker and uh, Barnes and Noble, put those buy links into, yes, Amazon gets a lot of sales. Let's list Amazon, it just makes sense. But let's also list the other guys as well because some people like to support local. They wanna go to their bookshop. So let's do that. Um, I also think a great author website is going to have a contact page. Fans, it's surprising sometimes that fans will email you and tell you what they thought about your book. They will ask you about something. They'll have comments. They want to connect with you. And so have a contact page, have a way for them either to do a contact form or your email address, whatever it may be, give them a way to get in contact with you. And on your contact page and throughout your website, you should also have the logos linking to your social media. Invite them to be a part of that. And I highly, highly recommend that every author website has an email collection. We talk about this a lot, having a lead generator. Make sure you invite people to sign up for your newsletter, to grab a freebie or something so you can collect their email address so you can continue to market to them in the future. So we want it easy to navigate. We need to know about you. We need to know about your books and we need to be able to contact you. Those are the three, in my opinion, most important things. If you're going to have a blog, you don't have to have a blog. Let's make that clear. But if you're going to have a blog, you of course want a blog tab. And I do recommend that if you're going to have a blog that you must blog with some regularity. That doesn't mean you have to blog every day. It could be once a month. It could be the 15th of every month, or maybe you do the first and the 15th, or maybe you do every Tuesday, I don't care. But some regularity is important if you're going to have a blog. Um, and I'm preaching to myself here because I know sometimes things happen, summer happens and we're like, oh, um, but it's important that if you're going to have a blog that you have some regularity there. Um, and if you have nothing to say, you don't, you don't have anything to blog about, hey, that's okay, don't have a blog. Um, that's okay. I have a, a client I'm working with right now who goes, I can't have a newsletter and I can't have a blog because I will fail at both and I know this. And I said, okay, well, it's good to know where your strengths and weaknesses are. So therefore, okay, don't have a blog, don't have a newsletter, but you should still have an insider's list where you collect email addresses so you can contact people when you have a new book or something new happens. So there are certainly different aspects to that. Um, but those are, in my opinion, the most important things, uh, not exhaustive. If I were teaching a whole class on this, we'd go more into it, but those are the basics I recommend. All right, everybody, it's right about 11 o'clock, so I am going to skedaddle. Um, next week, I will be in West Virginia for the Manuscript to Marketplace conference. I am so excited about this. So Manuscript and Marketplace is going to be in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. Woo -woo. Um, and I'm so excited about that. I am working to convince some of um, perhaps Alan Gibson, who has actually organized this conference, possibly other people who are either attending or who are speaking, trying to rope them in to be here with me for free advice Friday. So we'll see what happens. But I'm working on surprise guests. And um, of course, I'll be kind of busy from Thursday through uh, Thursday to Sunday. But if you're in the area, if you're in the area of West Virginia, it's Shepherdstown, West Virginia, which is like right on the border. Um, if you're in the area, I think you can still sign up. It's going to be fantastic. We've got Jane Friedman will be there. Um, Robin Cutler, who was previously the director of Ingram Spark and is now working um, in another capacity with a publisher is going to be there. Um, I'm going to be there. So if you're in the area, consider joining us. I think it's going to be fantastic. I will find the link. Look, I'll do it right now. Um, God forbid I was actually prepared. That would have made no sense. Um, here we go. It is being held at Shepherdstown um, University. So I'm going to put I'm going to try really hard to make sure that I can get this link in here. I'm going to send you the link. I don't think they have a virtual option, but it will look like this. So it is Manuscript and Marketplace, and it is September 9th and 10th. I'm going a day early. Um, but so 
feel free to join if you're around, if you're able. I think they're still selling tickets. If you're not able, again, join us next Friday and hopefully we'll have some A or some special guests that who can kind of chime in and share their um, knowledge with us. So I think it's going to be fabulous. I hope to see you next week. If you have questions, just email them over info at newshelves.com. I save them up for Fridays and I'll answer them live. And of course, if you're watching the replay or on Facebook, know that you can join us live and ask your questions at newshelves.com slash F-A-F. Thanks, you guys. Talk to you next week. Bye-bye.